Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Marketplace Forum. Uh, wow, what an incredible week it's been. The most phenomenal time in our School of Governance Intensive. I hope you managed to get some of those sessions. If you didn't, we should be able to get them online. But wow, what a powerful time we had. Uh, just with some incredible legends. Dennis Peacock, Michael Cassidy, um, Musi Maimani, Tuli Modenzello, just to mention a few. And uh, what an incredibly rich, rewarding, challenging time uh, where we were just grappling with uh, things of governance, things of the spirit, uh, how they apply to God, to business, to the economy, to the marketplace. And, um, and I hope you managed to kind of share some of that with us last week. If not, I know that a lot of this is going to be available online afterwards, and I would urge you and tap into as much of that as you can. Phenomenal sessions with uh, some phenomenal stalwarts that are operating in that space. About a week ago, I was invited to be part of a discussion. Uh, I was invited by our friends at God First, by uh, Dean Webb, and um, what an amazing time we had just exploring God, kingdom, work, and extending the gospel into every sphere of society. I was so blessed, and I trust that as you watch this this evening, you'll be blessed too. God bless you. We'll catch up again soon. We'll be back next week with the uh, formal edition uh, of the Marketplace Forum. Cheers. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking business. Um, guys, I know it's been a long Monday, but I want to encourage you over the next hour to please dial in, do whatever you need to find a quiet place right now, Go and settle down. Ask God to, to, um, to show you some things tonight. I'm sitting here with two amazing men who God has connected me with over the last while. We've got Vaughan McTaggart from the Abba Foundation, and we've got Dorian Wrigley, who's from Umborno Capital. Both of these guys are Christ followers. They love Jesus. They've been uh, anointed by God for business and business-like things. Uh, Vaughan more on the agricultural side of things, and Dorian more on the finance side. And so we're going to be delving in tonight into some stuff about work, about business, uh, about kingdom, and how we can th not only survive COVID-19, but thrive in a post-COVID-19 world. And so we're going to be here for an hour. It's going to be action-packed. We're trusting the Holy Spirit to direct us. Um, and uh, we're going to be talking for around 50 minutes, 5-0, and then the last 10 minutes are going to be Q&A. So please put your questions into the comment section, whether you are following us on YouTube or on Facebook, uh, and we'll have 10 minutes at the end where we will we'll try and answer most of your questions, if not all of them. Dorian, I know that you've, your, your Marketplace Forum guys are joining us tonight as well, so a big welcome to all of you. It's so great to have this kind of collaborative effort, and hopefully this is the first of many of these such things. But guys, first of all, I just want to welcome you and um, love to just hear about who you both are. Tell us about your family. Tell us about what you do, what our CEO in heaven has got you both doing at the moment. Um, Dorian, you want to kick us off? Dean, thank you, uh, my friend, and it is such a privilege and an honor to be here. Um, yeah, let's keep this short because I'd like to leave as much time as possible for us to just explore what God's got in his heart for us in uh, South Africa right now. But uh, God has called me primarily into the marketplace, and uh, I just love that. I love the local church. I'm an elder in the local church. I'm involved in church planting, but primarily God has called me into the marketplace. I've got a beautiful wife, Belinda, has an incredible destiny and call in her life. It's an honor for me to serve her in that. Two great teenage kids. One is doing matric this year. I think the class of 2020 is going to be a very special class. Thank and uh, and uh, my, my boys just started high school. Brilliant. Great to be here. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Vorno, who are you? <laughs> well, I was born Not who I, were you? Yeah, who I, are you? Thank God for that. Eh? Um, no, Dino, I'm married. got an incredible wife. I think uh, she's an absolute testimony to how women and wives in particular and mothers can save people and uh, how powerful their prayers are yeah. so uh, i've got a son who's now 19 years old two years out of school he's now studying a, a bachelor of commerce business and uh, my daughter's five years old that's another story for another ah. time. same wife guys <laughs> everybody asks me that question 
And uh, yeah, I've been God's God got a sense of humor. Absolutely. No, God answers prayers. Yeah. Um, it's an incredible testimony, and we'll share that sometime. Brilliant. And then, uh, yeah, predominantly in the marketplace, but my passion is, is evangelism. It's uh, using the marketplace for the kingdom. And how do we make that shift? So that is what I've been exploring. And uh, for the last uh, probably seven or eight years is how do we use the marketplace as a kingdom tool? Mm. And when, you know, is, the, is there a separation of kingdom from the church to the marketplace? And, and how does that all work? Mm. So mm. excited to explore that, excited to share uh, um, our experiences on that, but just excited to be here. So, uh, okay, boys. Okay, so let's start. I want to start tonight with a bit of a macro view. Okay, there are guys out there, people have lost businesses, people have lost jobs. There are many, many people out there who are feeling fairly despondent, fairly overwhelmed. Let's take a macro view back to the book of Genesis. Like, what is this all about? Is, is work and business a necessary evil, as I'm sure many people are feeling at the moment? Is it a burden? Or is it something else? Could there even be maybe hints of worship and, you know, just God honoring stuff in the toil of work and business? Who wants to give it a first crack? Dean, Dean, that's a brilliant question. And, you know, to be honest, I think it's one of the questions that the church has grappled with for way too long. You know, um, one of the classic scriptures taken out of context is, you know, in the New Testament where it says it's not about works lest any man should boast. That's about salvation. And absolutely, when it comes to salvation, there is nothing we can do. But when you look at the rest of the kingdom, pretty much it's all about work. Mm. When you look at, you mentioned Genesis. How does God introduce himself to the world? He introduces himself to the world by someone who rolls up his sleeves and he gets working. Amen. He gets working and he works super hard. And not only does he work super hard, but when he's done at the end of each day, he goes, that's good. You know, so he delights in the work that he does. And then, of course, he gets to the sixth day. And Genesis 1, 27 and 28, it's what we call the cultural mandate. God creates the pinnacle of his creation. He creates you and I, Adam and Eve, in his very own image, which means we reflect who he is. And then he says, he blesses them, and he says, be fruitful, be multiply, fill the earth, rule. And so we call to rule. And in the kingdom, ruling is spelled W-O-R-K. I've been captivated by this word. Sorry, Vaughn. I've been captivated by this word in Genesis, this Hebrew word, radar, R-A-D-A-H, which is dominion, which I think is a word that's got a bad rap because people tend to think about it as, you know, destruction and, um, you know, b being nasty to the planet and to people, that sort of thing. Whereas dominion is actually about taking the stuff that God has given us and shaping it to glorify Him and to help people, you know. And so just... Vorno, building on that theme, like, come on, I know that you've got some, 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 some God-inspired thoughts about what work and business actually are. Yeah, I love what Dorian's just said. So we get given dominion, and then we get put to work. Mm. So the first mention of the word work is actually in Genesis 2, uh, 15, where the Lord commissions Adam and says, okay, you know, you must go graft. And it's good to work. And it's, well, he would, why, why, would the Lord ask him to do something that's not, not good? good. Exactly. And uh, that word in Hebrew is a word called avodah. So it's A-V-O-D-A-H. Right. What is amazing for me about that word is it's exactly the same word for worship. Right. Wow. So work and worship in God's eyes is exactly the same thing. And let's not say, it's not my opinion. Let's just quickly, I just want to quickly look at a couple of scriptures. So, in some of the verses, avodah means work, as in work in the field, and to do common labor. Go to mm. work, go mm. to your office, do whatever you mm. do to work. Mm. And uh, Moses renews the covenant with God and says, six days you shall work. Exactly what you've just said, Dorian, Exodus 34, 21. Then man goes out to his work, avodah, to his labor until evening. Then God uses the same word, if you go to Exodus, he says, this is what the Lord says. Let my people go so that they may avodah me. Come and worship, worship me. me. Work for me. Worship yeah, me. Yeah. And then I think that the nicest one is, as for me, Joshua says. So Joshua says, yeah, but as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That word, word again is avodah. Same we way. will work and worship. So it's actually what Joshua is saying is, I will, I will avodah. I will work for 
and worship the Lord. So, you know, work and worship goes hand in hand. I think that's why Paul can so turn around and say, if a man doesn't work, a man shouldn't eat. Mm. Because he understood the principle mm. of work. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so I just want to hone in on this for a moment. So our attitude towards work, our posture towards work really matters. Dorian? Absolutely, Dean. I mean, if you, if you just think about it, you, you think, why does it matter? Well, it matters uh, because we created in God's image. And if God worked and he delighted in it, then, hey, we should be following his example. And we should be working and we should be delighting in it too. Reality check. A lot of people are burnt out, frazzled, not sure why they're even doing what they're doing. How can, you know, what kind of lessons do you think we could have learned out of this whole COVID-19 and the slowdown that's happened in a lot of people's lives? I mean, I think some, you, can, you can get burnt out from failure, but you can also get burnt out from success when you're doing, you, you don't actually know the reason why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and I think, you know, we are all susceptible to that as human beings. But what are the lessons that you guys think, we, you know, business people, um, people who are absolutely dominating at the moment, they're on the mountaintop, things are going well, and people that have gone through real hardship and loss over the last few months. What are the lessons that God is trying to teach us as employees and as employers during this season? You know, the Dean, as you were talking there, I think um, it struck me, and I kind of was reflecting, why is it that we burn out? And I think we burn out because we take on more responsibility than God intended us to take on. When you think about it, God called us to work, but that work is to rule with him. It's to partner with him. You know, every other creation account of the gods, and I'm talking about the little gods, the the gods that aren't for real, when they created mankind in their narratives, It was because they did not want to get involved with all this other stuff. And so they create the slave force to kind of work for them. But God doesn't do that. God says, I want to create a partner who's going to rule with me. Partners, male and female, who will rule with me. I think when we take on more than God intended for us to take on, we end up burning out. And I think that's got to be a key part of how we just stay focused and central to God's call on our lives. I'd like to add to what you're saying, Dorian, exactly the same train of thought, just a different spin on it, is to say, is what we're chasing after what God is asking us to chase after? You know, sometimes we don't get fulfillment in our work because we're not doing what we were created to do. You know, for me, God has given every single one of us and incredible talent, whatever that may be, mm. whether that be singing, whether that be banking, whether that be whatever it could be. But we need to use it for his glory. And we need to ensure that our purpose is driven to do what he has talented us to do, because that gives us fulfillment. Yeah. So I believe in a lot of the cases, I think that lack of fulfillment, that burnout, is because you are doing something that you were never created to do. Right. And that couldn't be more, I mean, everybody knows this passage, but in Matthew 6.33, it says there, but seek first the kingdom of God yeah. and his righteousness, yeah. his relationship, yeah. our relationship with him. Yeah. And all these, I love the Passion Translation, because in the Passion Translation it says, seek God and his kingdom. Yes. And then all these lesser things, these little things we chase after and burn us out, will be given to you abundantly. Wow. Wow. Will be given to you abundantly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. God is saying, just come, come after my kingdom. Yeah. Come after my kingdom. Not your kingdom. Not the kingdom of the world that got offered to Jesus on the Mount of Temptation. Not that kingdom. Come after my kingdom. And all these lesser things that you chase after your whole life. So I want you to expand on this, okay? I remember a guy called Bob Roberts who we had out here a couple of years ago. And he spoke about, he's big on this kind of stuff, okay? He spoke about that the church has got it all wrong. They've got the order mixed up, okay? And based on the scripture that you've just quoted, he said the order is K-D-S-C. Kingdom, Disciple, Society, Church. 
Do you think he's onto something? Like, like we hear this word kingdom, you know what I mean? And, and we've been praying about it outside here. We hear about this word kingdom in Christian business circles. It's, it's bandied around a lot. What are we actually talking about? I, I think he's got it spot on. You know, I, I think we, we tend to think that there's things, certain things that are holy and certain things that are secular nowadays. And I don't see that anywhere in God's word. Um, when we execute that cultural mandate, when, we are f- when God blesses us to take his presence to the ends of the world, it carries his delight. It carries his blessing. Now, somehow we think that when we're in a connect group on a Wednesday evening, that's delight. But when we're at the office on a Monday morning, well, that's not quite. I don't see that anywhere in God's word. When I look at God's word, I think about what are the, cert- what are the things that bring God delight? Well, it's, it's both what we do and it's how we do it. You know, firstly, how we do it, um, God is joyful. So when we serve and we work with a joyful heart, we represent who God is. Yep. That brings him delight. God is hardworking. He's efficient. He, you know, he's productive. When we are hardworking, when we are efficient, when we are productive, regardless of what the task is, we bring him delight. So good, man. Yep. And then finally, of course, what? What brings him delight? You know, again, I just want to use this illustration right here. You know, so the three of us are having a chat. People are watching. Uh, they would say, look, the work you guys are doing right now, surely that's holy. That brings God delight. But guess what? You know what, guys? We wouldn't be able to do this without. And I don't even know who made this microphone. Maybe it's sure. I look around the room and I see Sony cameras, right? Somebody bought these. Uh, uh, this table. Somebody cut this that's tree it. down, and, honed and, it out. And used their creative gift yeah. to do it. To, to put it together. Yeah. Now, which part of this is holy? All of it, right? Because none of this would have happened yeah, yeah. unless the person that cut this tree down, honed this and put this table together, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing here today. So you can pour cappuccinos to the glory of God. Amen. You can be a fuel salesman to the glory of God. You can't be a pimp to the glory of God. You can be a tax man to Glory of God, brother. <laughs> you, can even be, you can even be a SARS commissioner that's to the glory it. of God. Absolutely. And I, hopefully we've got one at the moment. And, and Dean, that's the key. You see, why can't you be a pimp to the glory of God? Go back to that's Genesis chapter 1, right? Yeah. The cultural mandate to take his presence to the ends of the world, to bring Amen. order out of chaos, to, bring, to take dominion, to bring harmony out of discord. Yeah. Yeah. When we are doing that, whether we're chopping down a tree to create this table, or whether we're preaching and studying the Word of God, if we are creating harmony out of discord, Mm. if we are creating order out of chaos, Mm. we are establishing, partnering with God in that cultural mandate. Mm. And that brings Him glory. Amen. Yeah, I think also, Dorian, on that is when we are living the kingdom, when we are living according to His Word, you know, you can't go and live outside of His Word and say things are okay that He doesn't say are okay. Yes. To the glory of God. Amen. We've, got to, we, we've got to operate within his kingdom. And I think this is the question. You know, are we maybe trying to fit his kingdom mm. in our kingdom mm. Mm. where we should be living his kingdom and this kingdom should die? And then you won't have Explain the difference. Oh. Yes, have you got four days? Come on, I mean, we've got time. You know, just, let's, just, let's, just talk about, let's just talk about one thing. I mean, what is the currency of this world? It's money. Mm. Am I right? We've even got a God that, that, that operates money. We've got Momon. So you've got, a, you, <laughs> you've got a demon that operates this thing we're all chasing after. So what are we actually chasing after? You know, now we go to God's kingdom. And what do you think the currency is of God's kingdom? I believe it's faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. So if we do all things in faith, we are operating with the currency of the kingdom of God. Whereas here in this kingdom, without money, I mean, we look at poor people. And we go, oh, we immediately say, well, they got a lack. They got a lack of money, or they got a lack of capital, they got a lack of housing, they got a lack of something. That person could have the biggest faith and could be the biggest kingdom operator that we've ever seen but we don't think like that because we've been zoned we've been almost uh, uh, um, (laughs) 
We've been, we've been programmed Conditioned. to a world system. Yeah. And I'm saying that's got to break. If you want this depression to end, you want to find fulfillment in what you do, we've got to break this kingdom system that we are caught in. And we've got to start living according to the kingdom of God. So tell us a bit more about that. And let's start getting into your own individual visions. Like, guys, the, these guys are nation builders. And God has given each of them a huge vision. And so I want to give enough time to hear about the Abba Foundation and Dorian about what you guys are doing with the Marketplace Forum. Um, speak to us a bit about your world, Warner. Okay. Fantastic. I think... As I, as I was explaining to Dorian earlier, I think my shift came in when I started realizing there's two kingdoms. And which kingdom do I actually belong to? And I think the shaking came for me with COVID. And I realized, but Vaughan, you are operating in the kingdom of the world for God that can't work. You've got to start operating in the kingdom. And I think this COVID allowed me to get rid of my idols. Let, let's just be really honest. This God is still slaying idols today <laughs> in the midst of global midst of, pandemic. I mean, if we really go and sit down, I mean, what is an idol? It's an obsession of something. I, I always say, go and check a guy's diary and checkbook and I'll tell you where he serves. Yeah. And so can a good thing be an idol? Absolutely. I mean, your, your wife could be an idol. Mm -hmm. Your children can be an idol. Your job could be an idol. Your car could be an idol. Anything you obsess over can become an idol to you. Yeah. And I think... It's time we slayed those idols so that we can live in that kingdom success, that we, can, that we can go and live that kingdom life that gets promised to us in the Bible. God says we co-heirs with him to everything. But we need to start living in his kingdom. I always talk about standing. Sorry, I'm, I'm, uh, this is very important. But I talk about standing. Now, le legally, you know, how do I get to the Krugersdorp court? Is I've got to either live there or whatever happened to me has to, has to have happened in that jurisdiction. Mm. For me to get a legal standing to go and see the judge in the Krugersdorp court. The kingdom and this kingdom are the same. So if I'm operating in this kingdom, and I'm operating by the kingdom laws, then I fall subject, and my standing is in this kingdom, in this world kingdom. Now I go to God and I say to him, but please help me, I'm in trouble. And he goes, but whoa, whoa, whoa. This is not under my kingdom jurisdiction. You're in another kingdom. You're operating in another kingdom. Wow. So you've got to go and stand under that kingdom unless you come and repent and come and realize that I operate in another kingdom. Then this kingdom has obviously got total power over that kingdom. Mm. When two powers meet, the lesser power will bow. So, you know, we've got to realize where are we operating and what kingdom do we represent? Yeah, yeah. So you spoke about how COVID has been a kind of opportunity for you to get rid of some idols. Like, give a bit more detail to that. Like, and uh, you know, uh, um, the, for me, it's been a time to reflect on what is consuming my time. Mm. Is it the transactions? Is it the deals? Is it the money I've got to raise to be able to do what I'm doing? Mm -hmm. Or is it God and people? Mm, mm. Is it about people or is it about the project? Is it about the movement or is it about the people? And God's taken us back to the people. You know, we were doing these massive projects across Africa, and I believe the Abba Initiative is from the throne room of the living Just God. explain a bit about the, okay, Abba, so the Abba Initiative, how, how it was born. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it in a very, very short, short uh, synopsis is... I believe God has asked us to go create, uh, to make people productive, which is why this is so apt. I said to the Lord, how do we change Africa and make my people productive? Mm. And it was just in the agricultural space because there is so much opportunity in that agricultural space to make people productive. I think by 2050, Africa is going to have more than 70% of the world's working population. The demographic dividend, as Kevin Ling's economist at so, Stan Lips calls it. Yeah. But what is the most important asset in God's kingdom? It's people. people. It's people. Souls, yeah. Absolutely. It's people. It's, whether you're a believer or not a believer, it's irrelevant. Yeah. God loves yeah. you. Yeah. God died for you before you got saved. While you were still a sinner, he gave up heaven. Are you an evangelist by any chance? <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to. Listen, anybody want evangelism? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so, so, 
it's, a, it's the cross of Jesus. I mean, our entire gospel is based on the cross of Jesus. So let's live the cross. So what we said is, what, you know, what would Jesus go and do? So I believe Jesus would help people to feed themselves. Mm. Jesus would go and spend time and understand the poor, the lost, the broken, the destitute, the widows, the orphans. Mm. And my question was always, let us teach them how to become good stewards of that little bit they have. Like the widow with a little bit of oil and, 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 and wheat. Make it for the prophet. Yes. She, you know, let's, let's go out. So our organization is about creating uh, a, 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 a center, a, um, a uh, mission station, if you want to call it that. But it's an agricultural, so it will be a citrus uh, uh, orchard or a pecan orchard. I also believe this maize across Africa is... There's so many more positive things we could grow. There's so much more with so much more value that we could grow in wow, Africa. That we haven't yet discovered. That we, you know, we're just growing maize everywhere yeah. we grow. And I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just saying I think God's asking us to look at something different. You know, I'm saying how do we start disinvesting from the kingdom of the world and start investing into the kingdom of God? How do we do that? But using that... Mm. to take people with us mm. you know we go to heaven one day you can mm. take nothing with you and mm. I, I'm sure you guys are all very successful mm. businessmen and whatever but everything you've got is going to stay behind it reminds me of that joke where the guy pitches up to heaven and he's cashed everything in and he gets there with pots of gold because uh, you know he's asked him to cash it in put it in his coffin he gets to pearly gates and there's St. Peter and St. Peter says to him so what's in the bag he says no no it's like my gold you know it's my possession he says why would you be carrying the tar of heaven in your bag you know, the streets of heaven, the Bible says to me, is made of gold. gold. Yeah. We're chasing after this stuff. We're killing people for it. You know, people are dying every day because of the love of money. And, and it's crazy. Yeah. So, you know, so what we're trying to do is create these havens where we can holistically start training people, firstly, in the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Firstly, in the love God has for them. What Jesus came and did for all of us. The power of the blood in the name of Jesus. Amen. And then say to them, but now you need to look after your families. Because of what Jesus did, you have to work. Okay, Vaughan, so quick question. So the other foundation, if, if, I have to think, if I have to talk about like helping people by giving them food, you guys do some of that. But it sounds like to me that you, you're far more interested in the developmental uh, training, helping people to work out how to farm macadamias, avos, I don't know what else God yeah. has shown you. Um, is that right? That's yeah. absolutely right. Should we be doing both? It, I, 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 in this time, we have to do both. Yeah. You know, it, it, I've always said a handout can be disastrous. Yeah. Africa's got this begging mentality because of handouts. Let us rather go, rather than give a fishing rod, let's teach somebody how to build a fishing rod. Mm. And that's really what this is about, is saying, listen, you've been given this power from God, you've been given this talent from God, and one day, please, I would like to share the testimony God gave me on Africa, mm. and, on the, and on the ability of Africans. But it's using that and saying, now that you've got this revelation of who you are in Christ, you go and work and look after your own family. Yeah. You go and stand up and do it, and we are there to help you. And what we want to do is we want to make sure it's commercially sustainable. So this is right. where the business element comes in. It's no good going with all this great bravado and saying, well, this is what we're going to do. God's going to make it happen. We need to use every element of the body to say, okay, but now, you know, Dorian, you're a businessman. Can this be sustainable? And if it's not, why would I teach it to somebody? Hmm. You know, for me to go and grow a quarter hectare of maize or a hectare of maize, I would never teach my son how to do that because I know he could never sustain himself. Mm. He'd probably feed himself, but he could never sustain his family. Mm. Why are we going around doing it to so many people? You know, there must be a better way. There must be a more a longer-term view. We're taking short-term views on long-term problems. And I believe that the church is being given these revelations because the church is supposed to rule. That's the right. government should be coming to churches and saying, what should we do in these situations? But the church is God said, to stand I will together. make my manifold wisdom known through SARS, the church, Donald Trump. No, no, I will make my manifold wisdom known through my church. Yeah. And, and so his church is what? Us. It's his people. His people. It's not a building. 
It's not it's these people. We are the church of the living God. Tell us a tell us a quick story. Tell us a success story from somewhere up in Africa of some of the stuff you guys have been doing. Sure. Where do we start? Where do we start? I mean you what's God up to in Africa? God loves Africa. And you don't, you don't, you you want to just prove it to you. Everything else in the world that is, you know, if we now talk about the developed world, is things man has built. Mm. Man has built economic systems, man has built beautiful trains and businesses and da 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 da. But let's look at God and when God started dealing out and giving. You tell me if there's anything you can find in the world that you can't find in Africa. Mm. Everything. We are sitting on an unpolished diamond. We, we, we are sitting on, a, an, on something that's incredible. And I almost want to venture to say that it's almost like God has kept it aside for a time such as now. It's almost like God said there's going to come a time when Africa will become the Egypt of old. And now I'm going to start giving it to, to, to my I told you there was going to be hope and inspiration tonight. Carry on. So I believe that we're going into a time, it's almost like a crossroads. Mm. COVID is a crossroads. And please, this is my opinion. I'm not saying God gave it to me in a vision. I'm not, I, I, it could, I, I believe it's spirit led, but I don't think I have all the answers. All I'm saying is that I believe that COVID was a crossroads. It was almost a cleansing period. Things like for the first time in history, we get locked up like the Israelites over Passover. Yes. You know, things like that should be a little bit of a telltale sign. This is something more than just a... Noah's Ark. Uh, yeah. Then, then, you know, so we locked up and, and God starts speaking to us and says, do you see I'm shaking all your idols? Everything that meant so much to you, the stock exchanges, the currencies, the businesses, Sports, I'm giving them everything a good shake. Weeks. All your idols. I'm going to take away for a while because I want to just spend a little bit of time. If I have to create or if I have to use this thing that Satan meant for bad, I just want to spend a bit of time with my church alone. Mm. I want them to be able to wake up and not have to rush somewhere and just come to me and let me just share with them. Let me just put my arms around them. Let me love them. Let me just hug them because that's the God we serve. He's not this God of war. Oh, you don't want to get on the wrong side of it. But I mean, mm. he's, 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 he's a loving God. He's an he's amazing an God. And he got us alone. I believe this is what COVID did. He got us alone and he said to us, this thing's going to change. There's not going to be the normal. I want my kingdom to come, my will to be done. So I'm going to start a shaking and I want you to lose your idols. I want you to really push into me because I'm about to do something really big. And the word that God gave me. I've been waiting for this. The word that God gave me for this for this season and actually last season was great expectations. Mm. And I've been, and I've been Dorian really pushing into God and saying, what does that mean? And he says, faith, 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 faith. Mm. Do you know who I am? Mm. Do you know the father that you serve? Do you know the mighty God that I am? If you knew me, these little things you're worrying about would be of no consequence. So 51% contraction in GDP irrelevant we serve a god that could change that tomorrow Amen. we serve a god that says uh, in a day i can change i can't remember the passage of scripture but i mean th there's a thing where the lord says i'll change the world in a day yeah, yeah. i'll change everything in a day he stopped the sun for joshua yeah, yeah, yeah. you know he split yeah. the sea yeah. for the israelites yeah, yeah. He could do anything beyond comparison i mean can you imagine the scientists trying to figure out how do you stop the sun it's impossible. Mm. This is the God we serve. Amen. And it's how much faith do we have in him? Mm. You know, the parable of the stewardship, the steward, uh, um, yes. you know, with a guy that got the one talent. Yes. Everybody's of the opinion that this guy got thrown out of heaven because he was bad with his one talent. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't, I, I, I think it's because he didn't know who God was. If you go read the yes. parable in Luke, the Lord says, your words have condemned you your words because he was saying to god look who you are and sometimes i feel we stand in front of god because of our fears because of our anxiety because of our worries mm. and we're saying god who are you actually mm. I, I i don't think you're a loving god mm. i don't think you are who you say you are knowingly or unknowingly we're doing that it's because we don't know god 
I think this great expectation is we need to know who our Father is. We need to know who our God is. And we need to take our trust and test him with it. Go put our trust in him and see. And see what he does. See, see what happens. And then start doing what he says to us yeah, to do. Yeah. So instead of becoming self-absorbed and self-centered and self-focused, let us go out and do what he said. Let us take that last bit of uh, uh, a wheat and oil we have. And let's go feed the poor. Let's go to the destitute and the lost, that the people that are worse off than we are. And if anybody wants to know where they are, come, I'll show you. <laughs> Let's go, let's go to the worst off than we are. Mm. And let's go serve on them. Right. I tell you, as you're speaking, it occurs to me as well, like for, for business people, especially A-type personalities that lead organizations and stuff, the grace that God has given in this time is for us to work out. If we thought that we were in control, it's now been proven we are not in control. And so it, it, it really is an opportunity for us to take our hands off the wheel, let go and let God kind of thing, you know. And that's the faith. Yeah. That's the great expectation. And the word that the Lord gave me just after that was, you put your faith in me. I'm going to show you an acceleration that the world has never seen before. Yeah. Things that took 10 years is going to take a day. Wow. There will be an acceleration because of that faith. Because my people have come back to me, dropped their idols. There'll be an acceleration. And you know what, son? It's going to be with relative Brilliant. ease. Brilliant. Relative ease. So just my message to everybody out there is God has got a much bigger plan than you ever had. Your five-year plan, your 10-year plan, your 50-year plan is far too small for our God. But let's start focusing our plan on his plan, his kingdom. Mm. And, I, and I tell people, test God in that. Go and do that. And not do it, you're doing it because you love God and see what he does. See what he does in this time. But that outward focus, that self-focus, that I, I, I must die. Because your reasonable sacrifice, sorry, your reasonable service is to give your lives as a living sacrifice. Beautiful. The unholy trinity, me, myself, yeah. and I Amen. must die. Yeah. Kingdom. So if there's a kingdom, there's a king. Dorian, I know that you guys are working on kingdom initiatives and that you've got a, a vision for our nation. Tell us a bit about that. And, and build off the back of what this well, man has just said. I, I was just amen, amen, and amen to everything that's been said. And I'm just thinking now, how can I add to this? And, um, you know, I believe the word God has given the church. The word as God has given us at the beginning of this in, pandemic this crisis was that he's going to turn economic hardship into an economic miracle wow. you know and so when we that requires when, faith that requires tons of, you know, I mean, <laughs> faith the size of a mustard seed can move mountains That's right this is where i think god's challenging us as the church mm. i think when i look at the word of god he says 30 60 and 100 times in the marketplace, we get excited at what? A 30% return? 8%. Yeah, 8%, 30%. 30 times is 3,000%. Yeah. Okay, so why? And I believe the reasons are all of these that we've mentioned where seek first the kingdom of God. But I think it's more, as we do that, God is going to start changing the way we see the kingdom. I mean, people get confused. People are arguing whether God's a capitalist or a socialist, mm. right? God's a capitalist because, you know, free market, and he loves the free market, and he loves to kind of, that is creativity, and God human is creative. Endeavor. Yeah. Human endeavor, creativity, profitability, and that's the only way that people are, so God's a capitalist. But then capitalism is based on greed. Mm. God's not greedy. So there, is God a socialist? Well, when I look at socialism, the one problem with socialism is there's just no incentive incentive to mm. do anything other mm. than just kind of yeah. and so it's greed but it's greed in reverse because yeah. I now do as little as possible because I'm going to get the same at the Breeds end of the day. Greed's mediocrity, right? What is God? God yeah. is God. Excellence. He, he is a kingdom thinker. Mm. So what does God say? God says people don't own everything. The state doesn't own anything. He says I own everything. Yeah. But now I give it to you as a steward. 
as those talents, I'm telling you to get out there and work. Why are we not seeing 30 times, 60 times, 100 times? Because we get confused. As soon as we see a little bit of success in our lives, we suddenly think, wow, it's all about me. It's me. It's I me. I've stopped. I'm, I'm, I'm. And we settle for 30%. 60, if we really shoot the lights out, we're talking 1x, 2x, 10x maybe. God starts at 30x. Mm. That's God's starting point. Mm. We started the Marketplace Forum because for too long the church has been thinking that kingdom-minded marketplace leaders are just simply Christians in those positions. Right. It's not. It's people that are saying, God, what is your heart? What is your plan for this nation? Yeah. How, I love what Vaughn's doing. I believe every single born-again believer needs to be doing what, God, what Vaughn's doing. Mm. Because then we're not going to need the NGOs doing it because every single one of us are going to be going, how do I transform the society around me? Amen. How do I create this? And I believe we're going to see incredible wealth flowing through the hands of kingdom-minded individuals mm. when God can trust them not to fall in love with the wealth mm. once they start creating it. So listen, I've chatted to you before about this concept that we talk about a lot at CoLab Foundation, compassionate capitalism. Yeah. Okay, not my term, but when I heard it for the first time, I fell in love with it. Yeah. I want to hear from you, Dorian, whether you would think that Jesus would align with compassionate capitalism. So let me explain it a bit. So compassionate capitalism honors human endeavor the Mark Shuttleworths, the Elon Musks of the world, okay? But to whom much has been given, much will be expected. And every one of those kind of business people who have been given the ability to generate vast sums of wealth are going to answer the question one day before the king whose kingdom this is, what did you do with it? How did you make the world a better place? So, I mean, would you go with compassionate capitalism? Dean, it's a no-brainer, my friend. It's an absolute no-brainer. But here, I think, is the challenge. We constantly think, God, when you give me excessive wealth, then. Mm. I'm saying, what do you got? Mm. COVID-19, how many of us looked after our domestic workers mm. and their children and kept feeding them even though they couldn't come through to our homes? I'm saying that's where it starts. Yeah. God's saying, I've entrusted this to you. Were you faithful? Were you for stewarding this? With stewarding. So it starts with what God never, tr never holds you accountable for what's not in your hands. Yeah, yeah. He didn't say to the guy with one, why didn't you do with the five? He said, what did you do with the one, right? So it starts. If we want to be faithful with a little, God will be true to his word. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. Uh, that... I'm telling you is a principle and if people could understand that principle it would be it would be a fireball you would you would literally see Christians taking up their rightful places as leaders and 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 goes and 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 God's God's economy has no end mm. but we need to start operating in his economy it's exactly what he's saying you know as soon as COVID hit what was the first thing that people did held on to what they had yeah. For goodness sake, South Africa went and bought all the toilet paper. <laughs> Let me look after myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if there's nothing left for anybody else, well, that's okay because I'm all right. You know what I often say? Eh? We're very good as South Africans, and this is not just a South African thing, but I think people are very good at thinking about their own retirement plan, yeah. their own business, their own kids. And, and I go back to the you know, company, the concept of a company. When it, the, the, the word company comes from a Latin word, apparently, two words, com and pane, okay? It means to come and break bread. That is the, the beginnings of corporate world, the beginnings of, of commercial stuff, is come and break bread. Let's do the butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker. How far have we fallen where it's now just about shareholder returns every year? Narrowly defined shareholder returns. What about we start applying as much thinking and effort and prayer to not just financial profit for our business and our family but for the people around us in our communities yeah. every business every school every whatever starts getting involved in that and you start generating not just a financial profit but a social profit i believe that's the heart of god dean uh, you've hit the nail on the head my friend i mean absolutely the heart of god you know you look at in matthew where he talks about the sheep and the goats. What does he say? 
He says, when you fed those that were hungry, when you clothed those that were naked, when you visited those that were in prison, when did I ever do that? You know, when you did it for the least of these, you did it for me. And that's what it's about. We cannot lose sight. And it's very clear what happens to the sheep and what happens to the goats. And God is calling us as marketplace leaders, that compassion, mm. compassionate capitalism, that's what it's about. Mm. We want to be the sheep in that story. So tell us a bit more about what we can do. So people are feeling inspired out there. They've, they've seen something. They've heard some amazing stuff from both of you. Like how can businesses, from small micro businesses through to large corporates, uh, I'm sure we've got financial and banking people out there watching, like what, how can people become involved in what you guys are doing, Dorian? Well, maybe I can just give a testimony, Dean. Um, you know, because I know we can get excited and we can talk about all these really cool things, and they're all true. But I know there's people out there right now watching and going, but man, I've lost my job. And as much as you guys are all excited about this, I'm in a different space. What, what about, what, how do I do this? I want to tell you a story, a testimony about a young lady, her name's Rebecca Lund, had a dream to become a chef, went down to Cape Town, graduated from chef school last year, started a job, very excited, worked for one of the popular restaurants in Joburg, COVID-19, bang. Mm. She sits down, she goes, what am I going to do now? John Marcoma in his book, Garden City, wow. yeah, kind of asks these three questions. I think there might be more, but I, the three I want to focus on. He says, when you're in a situation like this, ask yourself, what do I love? What am I good at? But the third one I really like, what does the world need? Mm. What do I love? Yeah, oh, look, I love football, but I'm not very good at it, so that's not going to help me in a situation like this. Okay, but what, am I, what do I love? What do I, but what does the world need? Mm. Rebecca sitting down, she goes, okay, I love creating nutritious, wholesome, value for money meals right oh and by the way i'm good at it i just graduated from chef school guess what we needed in the middle of COVID 19 when all the restaurants were shut down home delivery of good nutritious value for many meals she starts a company called bex the chef as the wrigley's we are great customers of bex the chef i want to tell you not only has she changed her world but she's created employment for a whole lot of other people because she just simply said god what do i do right now there's hope. There's hope. And I just want to encourage people, you know, you, you may be in between things right now. And God's word to you is that he has not fired you. That cultural mandate is as alive today as it was from the foundation of the world when he had you in his mind when he created you. That expression of that cultural mandate might change and probably will continue to change. And now's the time to say, God, what do I love? What am I good at? What does the world need right now? And trust God to show you. Outstanding. Forna, you want to add anything? No, I, I can only say amen to that because it's really, I mean, you know, it's, 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 I can go and lie down now and, 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 and you know, do nothing and, and feel sorry for myself. Or I can get up there and say, God, you are bigger than this. Mm. You are bigger than this COVID. You are bigger than that. Mm. Let me serve upon you. How do I serve upon you and your people mm. to get myself out of this? Mm. Mm. To get myself out of this hole that's been created. May, you know, I don't think God is doing this to you, mm. whoever is out there now. God's not doing this to you. Mm. I believe he's doing it for, for you. you. Wow. There is a bigger plan for you. There's bigger. I, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper and give you a future. Maybe he was taking you out of that kingdom mm. of this world to place you in the kingdom. And I believe there's going to be a crossroads. Mm. And we're going to have to choose which kingdom. Mm. Because things might not get back to normal. Mm. But things have started getting back to the new norm. Mm. Mm. But are we just going to take after this warning from God? Because I believe, I'm not saying God created COVID. I'm not saying yeah. he released it. Yeah. Yeah. But he's going to use it. Yeah. Now after after he's now used it to to get this word out and to say listen in one day i can shake everything that you hold above me yes yeah. Making i can good shake things, ultimate things yeah are we now going to go back to what we knew mm. or are we now going to say okay we're actually entering a new era not a season a new era we can't take what was from the old season into this new era 
We're going into a new era. Now I need to go and listen to God and say, God, what is your plans for me for this new era? No, I think that's so good, eh? I think for, for households as well, you know, Candice and I have found ourselves speaking about the things that we've learned in COVID about our life before COVID that we never want to get back to again. The pace of life, the things, you know, just the hamster wheel, you know what I mean? And so there, I think there are lessons like that for households and there are lessons like that for businesses as well. Why do we do what we do? Is the ultimate question, you know? And so I hope you're, that you're inspired. I hope that you're encouraged. We've got 10 minutes to go, so I want to get on to questions. Um, let me have a look here. Um, Dorian, chat about something while I look for the questions. <laughs> Have you sent any questions? Uh, what's up? Okay. Okay, let's have a look here. I'm getting there. Uh, right. Okay, question. How do we deal with failure and disappointment when things, when things go wrong? For example, the deal falls through, the product fails, or the business goes under. You know, Dean, that's, um, there are so many possible answers to that. Mm. But I think the one thing that kind of like, I think the one universal thing is that who we are is not defined by what we achieve. Mm. Who we are is defined by who we are in Christ. Mm. And so when we understand that that cultural mandate is the purpose of the reason why we work and the reason why we do deals and the reason why we do business is to extend his presence to the end of the world, then all, and when we also realize that we are just simply stewards of that which God has given us, it does remove a whole lot of responsibility for the outcomes. Mm. We you, are, you get freed up, huh? You, you get freed up. And, and mm. so, but, mm. was I diligent? Was I, you know... Mm. And without character, none of us would be able to sit here yeah. and speak tonight. Yeah. We've yeah. all been through those things. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not how you fall. Yeah. It's how you get up. That's it, eh? With faith, yeah. And, and, and Dean, just to follow on, because I think Vaughan, just, it's, it's just so, it's so powerful what he just shared. You know, at the end of the day, we, we mentioned it, the 1 Corinthians 3, where things are going to pass through the fire. That's how works are going to pass through the fire, you know? That's another justification why works are important. But what we fail to realize sometimes is that our whole time on earth is effectively just the preparation for eternity, Amen. right? Amen. It, it's, it's, yeah. it's kind of like... My daughter's matric this year. She spent 12, 13 years at school as preparing her for her career. Well, actually, the 70 odd years we are on earth is just preparing us for eternity. Yeah. So it's not so much about how many rands and cents and dollars, even though God can use that. What it is, it's about building the mm. character in our that's lives. It, and it. sometimes failures are there to unlock that in someone else's life. And we have no idea sometimes mm. how we respond in those failures. Are we going to do something that's a little dodgy to make sure we get it across the line? Mm. What does that say to those that are mm. watching? Mm. Or does it speak volumes when the guy that stole it from us sees us turn the other cheek yeah. and say, God, I'm not putting my faith and trust in that? So good. So good. Yeah, I think, you know, p part of the Christ follower journey is to go through the disappointment barrier at some stage in your life, whether it's in business or personal relationships or whatever. And I want to just say to you, if you're going through a really tough time in business, it, it makes a difference whether you cry your tears into nothingness or whether you cry your disappointment and tears into the lap of Jesus, you know. And so, and so, yeah, I mean, it's tough. Eh? I mean, uh, we, we've got a fish farm, as both of you know. It's been six years of blood, sweat, and tears feels like we're wading through mud, feels like we're drilling through a, a rock face. It's part of the journey, and it shapes us, for better or for worse. So, you know, sometimes God, in his kindness, allows us to be put onto the anvil and shaped. Yep. And uh, I don't know what your unique circumstances are, but I just want to encourage you to, to cry your tears of disappointment into the lap of Jesus. And there is hope Amen. beyond disappointment. Yeah. Um, I've got one more question. If the face ID will recognize me. Okay, question. <laughs> Pivoting has been real in business through this COVID season. How do you know that you've done a God pivot as opposed to your own pivot? Vona? You know, it is, 
which, which direction have you pivoted in for me? Mm. You know, have you taken this opportunity to really look at what you have been serving, who you have been serving, who your God really is? Mm. You know, this, this, for me, it is the direction that you're going in now. Does it serve the purpose of the Great Commission? Does it serve the purpose of the gospel? Knowing that God loves people. He loves, he loves everybody the same. I mean, <laughs> I, I still can't get it over me. I do a lot of prison ministry, and I'll sit next to a guy, and the guy will say to me, oh, well, he's in for raping children. And you sit there, and you go, I'm going to rip this guy's head off. And God says, I love this guy, man. I love this man so much. Come and died for him. You know, and then you see how these guys change and what God does for them. You know, God, God wants you, you know, this disappointment, this, 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 this failures. He wants you to draw closer to him and pull into him so that he can give you secrets. You know, the reason Jesus speaks in parables is to, is to release the secrets of the kingdom. He gives 40, I think it's 40 parables, and it's releasing the secrets of the kingdom. Go and sit down, this pivoting, go and sit down and see... Has your pivot put you more in the direction of the kingdom of God? That's great. Or has it gone and taken you back into the world? It, it, you know, you can pivot. You know, unfortunately, a pivot can go 360 degrees. <laughs> Very good. You know, it can go all the way yeah. back to yeah. where you started. Yeah. Now, the thing is, can we? I mean, it's like repenting. Repenting is a 180 degree turn. It's literally saying, listen, I'm wrong. Turning 180 degrees and walking in the other direction. Are we taking the lessons we've learned from this, this, this COVID? Which I believe this is just a warning. If you think this is the end, <laughs> go read Revelations. Uh, this is the beginning. But shouldn't we all just put our heads in the sand there? I don't want to get into another conversation, but just quickly. I mean, and I'm being, playing yeah. devil's advocate here, yeah? but shouldn't we just put our heads in the sand and the whole world and the whole universe is going to pot? So, you know, why should we even attempt anything with hope and why would you want to put your head in the sand is it because your kingdom is collapsing because the kingdom of god is forever there we go the kingdom of god is forever mm. uh, and the kingdom of god will never end mm. the kingdom of god will never shrink mm. the kingdom of god is going nowhere mm. Mm. the kingdom of god he's preparing a place for us now can mm. you imagine it took god okay seven days according to the bible to create the heavens and the earth and i mean we haven't explored I think one third of the ocean's depth. We found stars, Canis Majoris, 300,000 light years away, and it's just the beginning of his kingdom. And it took him seven days. Jesus has been gone 2,000 years preparing a place for us. Can you imagine what it's going to look like? So I'm saying, which kingdom are you trying to stick your head in the sand for? Because if it's the kingdom of God, you'd hold your head up high and you'd say, my God. Yeah. My God, if Jesus, amidst all the chaos and degradation, is saying, Woman, do you not perceive it? Man, do you not perceive it? I'm making all things new. And, and the Lord says, In your weakness, you are strong. In the world, it's the opposite. In your weakness, we kick you. You're a dog. It's a dog eat dog place. In the kingdom, it's exactly the opposite. It's in your weakness, you are strong. So, which kingdom are you living in? And which kingdom have you pivoted towards? Parting shot before we pray, Dorian. Echo, yes and amen. And, uh, and, and just to say this, that when we experience resistance, we know we're on the right track. You know, when um, Jesus planted the wheat, the, God planted the wheat, the enemy comes in, plants the tares. He doesn't remove the tares. He says, no, I will not remove the tares. Why? In case I remove one of the stems of wheat. So they grow together until that final day when the tares are removed and the wheat remains. So the fact that we're growing alongside tears, which are uncomfortable and resisting, praise God, that means something's right. Guys, I want to just thank both of you so much. Um, it's been everything I hope for and more. And I feel like God has really led us in this discussion tonight. I hope, as I said before we entered here tonight, that this is the first of many chats and many collaborations and um, many beautiful things that God is going to do in our great nation and on our great continent. And so I want to pray for each one of you out there. I want to pray for these guys. And uh, yeah, I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much for joining us.